think we can start. The plan for this morning, ladies and gentlemen, is that we continue with the Soziale Marktwirtschaft, political economy. Um, I made a typo on my uh, slides last time, so I apologize for that. I forgot the, the E, Soziale, and uh, I think there was a, a complication about, or here, with the C. I put the C somewhere else, um, Wirtschaft, Wirtschaft um, economy, social market economy. Uh, this is what we've been talking about, um, economic policy making. Um, but this morning, um, I'll look at the social part of the, the soziale part of the social market, uh, which uh, uh, social market economy. So we've talked more about the economic aspects of social market economy. So well, this morning I'm, I'm planning to talk about the social policy aspects of um, social market economy. Um, but just just to be on the safe side, let, let's let's look at this very quickly. Um, we're talking about the market aspects here, a combination of competitive economy, um, market economy, um, and the generous welfare state, which we shall be talking about this morning. Um, and policies are generally indirective and supporting the markets. Um, we have a flexible system in which we have regulation, but the state provides framework regulations, small amount of nationalized industry, so collectivization is much less. Although we have, um, you know, um, by OECD standards around average um, um, or a little bit larger or higher than average public employment in the public sector, um, we have a smaller amount of nationalized industry and we have what's called a what's called cooperative federalism, which I shall be talking about when I talk about governance and policy making. Um, Bank-centric uh, bank model of economic development, this is an example of stakeholder capitalism. So each, the industry, let's say I gave you the example of a, a glass industry, glass factory, uh, side by side with a, um, a, um, a bank. Uh, let's say we're talking about the city of Bielefeld uh, in Germany. So Sparkasse Bielefeld, um, savings bank of Bielefeld, side by side with a glass factory there. Let's assume that this is the case. Um, each has a stake in the life of the other. So, or um, the bank has also a stake in the life, in the future of the glass factory. And there are joint appointments in the executive boards, and this is a, an example of what's called networked or coordinated capitalism. Okay, at the firm level, there is all kinds of coordination. Um, high wage and also high welfare, high um, benefit system, but extremely competitive system. We talked about the German um, apprenticeship system. Uh, you know, the Meister and the, the, uh, the, the apprentice. Uh, so vocational training is very important in this, in this political economy, in this, in this system, which fosters high skill development. Okay, so skill development is, is very important. Highly skilled workforce, um, you know, means that we have a higher productivity, a higher labor uh, productivity, but overall, total factor productivity, but overall productivity uh, is, is much higher uh, than, than elsewhere. Um, works councils, uh, these are not unions, these are um, firm level institutions in which uh, we have, um, we, have um, uh, we have workers voicing their, articulating their interests to the management. And um, a comprehensive R&D research and development strategy. We talked about what research is and also development. Development was once again all about, um, you know, inventing a marketable product once the research stage is or has been completed. And we've got the Bundesbank, uh, which has been providing a stable, uh, conducive ground for economic development. 
Okay, so, so for the industrialization drive post-World War II, the German economic miracle, um, so easier fiscal policies, but tight monetary policies. So, so macroeconomic policy is solid, sound overall, uh, very low levels of budget deficits. When we talk about budget deficits, ladies and gentlemen, what do we refer to? Budget deficits. What was budget deficit? Budget deficit, come on. Good morning, good morning. Budget, whose budget are we talking about? It's the government's, right? It's the government's budget. So government's budget is composed of? Taxes. Receipts, taxes, and? Expenditures. So budget deficits involve less expenditure is higher than okay so so we've got it we've got during the post-world war ii era um low levels of budget deficit despite easy uh expansionary fiscal policies um but at the same time we also had very low inflation rates due to um the tight monetary policies the bundesbank has been um has been following has been designing and implementing um Behind these ideas were, remember? Okay, let's see. The hyperinflation huh? experience of the 1920s, early 1920s. So, um, so you have to rein in, you have to control um, monetary expansion, so, 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 so monetary base. So, so you have to be. Um, uh, the Bundesbank has been quite conservative in its posture in terms of um, implementing um, monetary policies. So, so this was the uh, this was the economic aspects or market aspects of soziale Marktwirtschaft, social market economy. Now, let me delve into um, social policy aspects of. Uh, the social market economy or social market e economic system as we've seen in the German political economy as, as, as representing the German political economy, especially uh, during the world, I mean, post-World War II era. Okay, so, so second half of 20th century. Uh, we've got a generous um, welfare state. Remember we talked about social insurance. Um, or we talked about, we didn't talk much about social insurance, we talked about the welfare state. Remember, um, there were many programs that make up the welfare state. And these programs, um, in some political economies, it's a more social insurance based programs. Social insurance. So what were the welfare state programs once again? I know we've had quarreled about this uh, a few weeks ago. So what were the welfare state programs? You may look at your previous notes. I'm just kidding, Ali, please. Healthcare is one. Come on, guys. Pensions is another. Education, okay, let's assume that this is part of the welfare state, which is in, in fact part of Sena. Childcare, huh? Disability programs. Very good, okay. What a relief, okay, I feel much better now. So, so all of these programs are supposed to protect labor market participants, i.e. employees, from risks in the labor market. What are the risks? One risk is pregnancy, so maternity benefits. Or uh, another risk is we may feel sick, huh? We, we, may, um, we may get sick, right? So, so health care and sickness programs. Another risk is getting fired, right? So that, that's also another risk, which is uh, so unemployment benefits, right? So, so the state provides socialized insurance, okay? Another risk is, we hope, Retirement, we hope that we reach retirement age and we hope that risk materializes, right? We all want to retire at some point. We all want to be able to be retired. 
uh, or we all want to be able to retire um, at some age. So, so if and when that risk hits, if and when that risk materializes, um, the system will protect us against the costs associated with this. We will not be able to participate in the labor force, right? Or we may get um, involved in an industrial accident, what's called the industrial accident, huh? accident on the job. Uh, so so we, may get, we may be receiving disability benefits for some time for an extended period of time, God forbid. Okay, so, um, so, so all of the system, it's called social insurance system. It's socialized in the sense that the state is involved, it's collectivized. It's insurance because we all pay premier to the system. Let me explain this. Uh, I'm not sure whether I explained this in detail to you um, previously. Um, so what we do is that we have uh, our employees, employers, let's say, and employees, so workers, um, let's say, um, Gizem makes, let's say, $2,000, 2,000 or 2,000 euros a month, um, or let's say, let's say, 2,000 2000 Turkish lira a month. Um, some of this will go to, this is your, this is Gizem's gross monthly salary. Some of this will go to, go back to, the state in terms of taxes. Let's say uh, among the 2,000 lira, let's say, um, give, give me, whoa, that's, give me a tax rate, I was going to say. Out of 2,000 lira, if you say 1,000 lira, the tax rate is 50%. Come on. 20, 20, give me, give me a tax rate, 20, 20%. So that makes, 400 lira deducted for uh, personal income taxes. On top of this, there may be other deductions, this, that, and the other, but uh, my point here is that there's going to be another lump sum which is collected for the social insurance purposes uh, institution. And we have in Turkey, we have the Social Security Institution, uh, which is called the SGK, Sosyal Güvenlik Kurumu. Okay, so um, let's say another 300 lira go to uh, Gizem's account in the in the social insurance system or social insurance institution. Um, so, so it makes. So net-wise, it's, it's come down to 1,300 lira. So what happens is Gizem's 300 lira go to here. Gizem's employer, let's say Bilkent University, puts in another 300 lira, goes into Gizem's account. This is Gizem's account. And the state also puts in another, let's say, nekadar, or let's say 400 lira. So 300, another 300, and then another 400, that makes 1,000 lira accumulating every month for every 2,000 lira Gizem earns. Out of this account will be paid Gizem's retirement pensions, but also maternity benefits, childcare benefits, huh? unemployment benefits, healthcare, sickness benefits, will all come through this collectivized account. It won't be Gizem's account, but from the collective social or socialized account. Okay, so, so this is um, the social insurance system in a nutshell for you, all right? So, so, um, so the German system um, has its roots 
in, um, in the Bismarckian era, so 1880s. All right? It goes back as, as late as that, as early as that. In fact, uh, everything starts with industrial accidents. Okay? Then pensions, then healthcare, then this, that, and the other. And by the uh, post-World War II era, by the end of World War II, uh, we see a full-fledged comprehensive social insurance system running in place. Uh, so, um, so all of these, oh, I gave you some hints over there. Um, generous welfare state social insurance. I hope you didn't see that and then were answering my questions. Healthcare and employment pensions um, and, and all that. Um, this was the outcome of a negotiated settlement between major social forces of the time. Okay, so, so capital and labor. Remember collectivist consensus. Huh? We talked about consensus era um, in, in, I'm sorry, in Britain, then also in France. Um, so, so this was the, uh, the outcome of that particular era, the consolidation, the crystallization of the German welfare state system known as the Wolfahrtstaat. Um, so um, then comes the institution of democratic corporatism, sometimes known as neo-corporatism, to distinguish this from, to distinguish this system from um, earlier forms, early 20th century forms of um, authoritarian forms of corporatism. Um, so in, in this system, uh, we have interest intermediation uh, between three, um, three players. So we have the state, we have capital, let's say employers, and uh, we have labor as employees or workers. So we have a tripartite system of interest intermediation. Uh, the state is also part of this system. It's a system of negotiation among privileged organized actors which have access to this governance system. Okay, so, um, so employers are organized under uh, business associations. And employees, workers are organized under, which are called in English? Unions. Thank you. Unions. So these are privileged actors, um, collectively organized and mobilized, and they bargain with the state on matters that are related to uh, industrial or working, working life. Okay? Let's say health and safety at work occupational safety, uh, occupational licenses, um, collective bargaining in terms of, let's say, minimum wage laws, which we never had in Germany, a, a nationwide minimum wage law, but, but has been, um, so, but, but the wages have been quite, uh, quite high. So, so it's, a, it's a bargaining system. Um, it's a system of interest intermediation, interest articulation. Um, among privileged actors, organized collective actors. It's a stable pattern in the sense that it's institutionalized. Um, it's lifetime you know is not short, so you know that next year you shall also be convened to this tripartite system of bargaining, negotiation, cooperation, coordination, and consultation. Okay, so cooperation, coordination, consultation, bargaining, uh, intermediation. These are the key words that that um, that that um, that really define uh, democratic corporatism, which produce negotiated outcomes, because these are outcomes of negotiation. These are outcomes of uh, coordination, bargaining, uh, and cooperation. And this is, um, this is quite in contrast to um, other forms of interest intermediation, such as 
pluralism, which we never really talked about. I may have, um, I may have briefly touched upon pluralism, pluralist modes of interest intermediation. Um, this is, as you can see, among collective, institutionalized, organized actors. Some institutions have privileged access, so the state acknowledges that this is a networked society. These are my business associations. In fact, this is my business groups, or these are my employees, and representing you, the group of employees, is one of your friends, um, and let's say a second friend of yours. There are two different sectors, let's say, in this economy, which are the most competitive, and I acknowledge them as representatives of you, and I acknowledge these three who sit in the front, representing um, my, my many workers in different segments or sectors in, um, in the political economy. So I provide access to them, so one, two, here at representing business, and then another three representing uh, labor. So, 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 so one group, or group one, group two, group three, we ne negotiate, we consult one another, uh, we coordinate, um, and, and we arrive at negotiated outcomes. Um, uh, in contrast to this model of privileged access, institutionalized privileged access to me, um, as, as, the, as government, um, is what's called pluralism, in which I do not pick and acknowledge um, privileged actors. I do not privilege any actor. So whom, it's, it's, it's less of a networked society. It's less of an organized society, such as in the case of the US and or um, Anglo-American countries, Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, Britain is another example in which we have pluralist forms of interest intermediation uh, where um, agents are not collective or organized. Agents are more atomistic, more individualist, acting in a more individualist way. Um, and um, I negotiate with whomever is the most powerful among you as agents. Okay, so, so there is no privileging, there's no collective um, or per semi-permanent institutionalized regime-like institutional links between me and particular actors in society. Whomever is powerful will help say the last word. Okay, so, so this is the pluralist system of interest intermediation, which is in contrast to corporate, uh, I'm sorry, democratic corporatist or neo-corporatist ways of um, making policy, um, taking decisions, um, you know, through all kinds of negotiations, consultations, coordinations, and cooperations, okay? So, so in a networked society, only in a networked society can we speak of um, organized, collectivized actors in which we have privileged access to the system of interest intermediation as well as policy making. Is this clear? Okay, any questions? All right, so um, there have been some challenges since uh, the 1980s in the system. Um, high unemployment has been one area of, um, you know, one area of problems, crisis, um, 1980s, late 1970s, world economic crisis had ramifications for Germany, um, you know, power shift alternation from an, a coalition, CDU, SPD, we'll talk about this later on, to a uh, conservative um, government under Helmut Kohl, um, plus 1990s reunification, costs of reunification, uh, which have seen rising unemployment. Rising unemployment in a system as such means that the state's resources are being used huh, for unemployment benefits, right? So unemployment benefits um, have, been, have been increasing in response to rising unemployment. Um, and also vocational training systems, apprentice 
ship programs could not effectively absorb the Western apprenticeship program, the Western uh, vocational training programs could not uh, effectively absorb what was coming from um, the East, uh, workers coming from the East. So, so there were some, some problems with respect to coordination um, and, and all that. Uh, costs of unification or reunification uh, was also important. So infrastructural costs um, meant that the state's resources had been quite limited. So, so, um, so this was another problem. Um, and sustaining corporatist institutions was another problem uh, with respect to uh, responding to all of these shocks in about a, a, a decade or so. Okay, so world economic crisis plus reunification. And uh, by this time, the European Union was consolidating. Okay, the, the, we had European econo Economic Community, uh, European Union, uh, Germany was or has been one of the locomotives, motor forces in the system. Uh, the single market program competitiveness was uh, very important with rising costs. Okay, so you, I mean, your industries had to be extra competitive in a given single market. The single European market program was supposed to be completed by about the early 1990s. It was called the 1992 program. Um, so so um, there were demands for increasing competitiveness, but at the same time, um, the German economy was struggling with ramifications of the economic crisis. Uh, but not all that, not, a, not only that crisis, but also the exogenous shock of reunification. So, um, so there, were, there were much tensions during this period. Um, social cleavages, we generally talk about social cleavages, inequality, when we talk about political economy, as we've been doing so for the past three cases. This is the fourth case. Um, ethnicity has been um, a complicating issue. Um, racism, xenophobia, um, especially in response to the world economic crisis of 1970, late 1970s. So, so throughout 1980s, um, the Gastarbeiter, the guest workers, who were warmly welcome um, just two decades ago, um, late 50s, early 60s, all throughout 60s, all throughout 70s, were feeling that they weren't welcome anymore. Okay? because of uh, immense pressures um, in the labor market that, um, that many felt with rising unemployment, many native-born felt that the Turks, the ex, what was called back in the 80s, Yugoslavs, the Italians were stealing our jobs. Um, then they realized that that these were stealing, were getting the bad jobs. But, um, but by the time they've, or before the time they felt this, um, there, was, um, there were many incidents in Germany uh, in which there were all, you know, many Turks, um, Turkish gast Gastarbeiter, uh, were, um, were lit on fire, uh, for example, in Zollingen back in the 1980s. Um, which was a massive incident um, in German um, history um, during the 1980s. Um, and on top of these pressures came um, reunification with all of its shocks associated with it, um, which meant that unemployment further increased, states' coffers in the vault, um, you know, um, so, so receipts, payments, expenditures, taxes, um, imbalances, so cutbacks, um, a, um, a reunification tax, a poll tax of 7.5% on citizens. This all meant that the pressures had been increasing, um, which you know, many scholars associate with rising xenophobia, rising um, 
racism and all that um, in the in the 1980s, 1990s, and tech shortages of 2000s, the dot com um, busts. Um, so, so again, another recession back in the um, 2000s. And by the way, uh, early 1990s were years of recession in Europe that had struck Europe, not only German uh, reunification, but also this was uh, a time of economic bust. Um, things looked meager. Um, unemployment had been, had been high all across Europe. Uh, there were some, some banking crises up north, which had ramifications for, for all across Europe, too. Um, so, so 1980s were years of crisis. 90s, early 90s were years of another set of crisis, recession. Uh, early 2000s, again, recessionary years. Um, Indian softwares were making up to the, uh, the headlines, getting green cards, getting, getting uh, licenses to work, work permits to work in Germany, whereas the native-born population were feeling that they, were, um, they, they couldn't compete with uh, foreign-borns. So, so that, that added to, to all this. Please. Germans? Uh -huh. Well, first origin, remember we talked about Prussia, which was a patriotic system. Um, it was a nationalist. Um, well, I mean, like, there was, there was a nationalist system. The, the state system was, um, was um, fostering nationalism. And Napoleon's defeat of Germany. Then came World War I. Germany defeated the world's superpower, industrial superpower, got defeated in about less than 20 years again. So early 1900s, 1800s, early 1900s defeat, massive boom after World War II. Um, you know, um, in interestingly, under Weimar Republic, then came, um, then came Hitler. Uh, world went into a recession, depression, 1929. Germany didn't. Germany was booming, continued to boom. Um, so, so, so massive economic growth, late 1930s, war again, defeat again. So one defeat after another in less than 150 years. Um, just imagine, imagine the, the guilt in the psyche of an average citizen and also the war guilt attached to it. I mean, like defeat, I'm sorry. Imagine the defeat as, as well as the guilt, okay? So, so this is one way of... Um, of more of a probably psychological reaction to, to, to all that. I'm not an expert on this, um, but, but, oh, but, but when I read about all this, I'm, I'm, what I make of it is, is just, just imagine all kinds of like consecutive defeats in a matter of three generations uh, or, or five generations. And, and, um, and this meant that um, one shock after, after another, economic shocks, 70s, 80s, 90s, that this was um, xenophobia, like um, the Gastarbeiter, no more welcome anymore. Um, so, so all of these really added to, um, to xenophobic elements. And we, we saw uh, 1980s skinheads on the streets. Okay, um, sympathetic to um, Hitler's ideas, um, uh, ultra-right ideas, nationalistic, uh, overly you know, ultra-nationalistic ideas. So, so I, I associate some of this to, um, to late Prussia, um, so Napoleonic defeat, 
um, being, feeling backward, catching up, in fact, superseding everyone. By 1900, Germany was the industrial leader of the world. Just imagine, industrial revolution had started in uh, mid 1700s in, um, in Britain, then scattered. Germany came into the system much later. Uh, 1900, late 1800s, scramble for Africa and East Asia. No more markets, no more raw materials. Everything was um, cannibalized by, by other imperial powers. So Germany could only catch whatever it found, found um, in terms of its colonial imperial past. But then, um, in a matter of less than 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years, you know, by, you know, right after being the superpower of the period, industrial-wise, industrial stronghold-wise, stronghold industrial uh, locomotive-wise, um, it found itself defeated. And um, the Treaty of Versailles, I told you about, you know, we talked about this, you know, the conditions for war reparations were so grave that it was this, that, and the other, that the Germans felt, okay, this is not fair. And then reindustrialization from scratch, almost scratch, reindustrialization, because you know, um, when you look at even after World War I, Germany was devastated. Um, physically devastated. Um, so, so reindustrialization, an economic miracle, when the world was going through economic depression, 1920, late 1920s, early 1930s, Germany was booming, okay? Um, miraculously booming um, under later, uh, under Hitler's reign, um, and then defeated again. So massive defeats brought with it all kinds of guilt, which probably had to be steamed off in one way or another. There, there was, I mean, these are, I, I, I personally feel that these are reactions to, to all those political, military, as well as economic defeats of the period. Um, so this is how I, how I explain it personally. I've never studied this, uh, these aspects of, of um, xenophobia, uh, you know, reactions against the Gastarbeiter, you know, what were the individual level uh, reasons behind all of that that happened. Um, but I, I tend to associate them with, with all of these defeats and the guilt and the, uh, the shocks that, that, uh, that German uh, political economy went under. Um, so that would be my, my short answer to that intense question. Um, Gender-wise, men still dominate um, both management in German firms and also unions. So it's, it's a man's world. Um, this, is the, um, this is the western part of Germany, uh, whereas in the eastern part of Germany, things were different. Uh, greater social rights, economic rights, for women, um, um, also abortion rights were, uh, were much liberal in the East as opposed to the West. Anyone who's seen uh, Goodbye Lenin, the movie Goodbye Lenin, a few of you. So, so remember, um, remember uh, the protagonist's mother uh, who, was, who was a teacher, who was a leader, uh, who was uh, a, a model, who was an ideal, um, ideal woman figure in society. Um, so, so German women have been, Eastern German women, had, been, um, had, had, had more access to all kinds of economic, social rights than, than in, the, in the West. Um, but when you look at German lands in history, uh, we've got a conservative welfare state, so women's rule had been uh, relegated to, um, to um, 
the house. In fact, there were there was a um, there was there were wartime posters. Um, um, actually, early um, 1920s, 1930s, uh, which relegated the role of women to uh, Kinder, Küche, and Kirche. So Kinder is again, help me, children, Küche, kitchen. So the house, the foyer, um, and also Kirche. Um, so, so, so church. So, so, so women's roles as mother and wives um, mostly confined to the house. So we have a quite conservative system um, in which uh, we had lower levels of labor force participation among women historically, but this has been, um, has been changing massively. And now we have about two thirds of all German women participating in the labor force, uh, Gesundheit. Um, and finally, generational gap. Demographic pressures meant that the elderly, the German, German population is, going, is becoming old. Um, it's aging. So um, imagine a workforce. Uh, we have an increasingly smaller population, part of the population younger, who are more productive in terms of participation or, or contribution to the labor force, but also into the domestic economy. Uh, in addition to this, we have larger expanding population, share of the population, expanding um, of the older workers and also uh, the elderly. Okay? So, we call this, we measure this ratio um, in demography and also in, in welfare state studies, what's called the dependency ratio. Excuse me. Um, the old, olders, the elderly, um, it, it looks at the size of the elderly population, those outside of the labor force, as a share of the active labor force. Okay, and this ratio had been increasing in Germany. So less and less number of people or lower and lower shares of the workforce or population had been producing. But um, an expanding elderly population who had been um, not contributing to the labor force and in production, therefore. So, so, so with those of you expanding and these of you contracting, shrinking, we have a higher dependency ratio, which means that um, we all thought that the German system was like a time bomb in the sense that it would explode someday because um, there are less number of people contributing into the social insurance system and more number of people relying on it, okay? And in time, um, this is not going anywhere either. So it's not a matter of now, it's a matter of the future, meaning that these guys are aging and they're expanding and these guys are young, they'll be aging and they're shrinking. This, ma this meant Incoming resources are shrinking. Outgoing resources are expanding. That was why uh, back in the 1990s we thought that many um, European economies uh, were going to be facing pension time bombs uh, because you'll be requiring pensions. These guys will be producing for you. Okay? The younger workforce will be producing, contributing, um, you know, with their productive powers, and these guys, an expanding share in the population would be, um, would be using all the resources that they had been uh, producing, and these guys had been shrinking, and those guys had been expanding. So, so this, this was a metaphor that we used back in the 1990s uh, of a pension time bomb. 
which didn't really um, happen to the extent that um, the doomsayers predicted uh, because of rising um, productivity in, in due part uh, to rising productivity, technological advances, but also uh, lower levels of exit from the labor force. We thought that uh, the older workers would be exiting from the labor force, but this, isn't, this hasn't been um, the case, um, at least to the extent that we thought it would. Any questions on um, the political economy? Hmm? Okay, let's take a break then. <laughs>